comedy is kind of spoon feeding the same topics over and over again mm. and it hasn't really been creative in a way where it, it doesn't really expand your mind nowadays it's just more proper to be controversial like that's what people are doing now like it's not even about being funny no more it's about being confident when you say something controversial mm. and seeing if you can keep the crowd specifically the r joke like i mean the r word mm. like if bernie mac or steve harvey 30 years ago would have said the R word. That wouldn't be the butt of the joke. Right. The butt of the joke would be something else. But now people are just like, and they kind of say the R word and that that's it. It's just like they want people to be, oh, he actually said it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like now people have like, they've gotten so soft that like the fundamentals of how comedy started mm. are just kind of being distorted. And now it's just about like, well, I was thinking it, but he said it mm. instead of, I never thought about that, and it's funny. Mm. Oh, yeah, I'm getting my back. Oh, yeah, I'm giving it back. Oh, yeah, they bite my swag. Don't chew it on time, chew it on crack. Oh, yeah, don't only care if they buy. Don't only care if they buy. Don't only care if they buy. I'm spreading positivity. Welcome back to the Treehouse Show. You just listened to Biters by yours truly. I am your host, Gartasia, and you are tuned into the chillest podcast in the universe. Today we have an extremely eccentric guest. We have a comedian. We have a storyteller. We have somebody who's overcome great trials and tribulations to be here, to be who he, he is today. We have the one and only, we have Cozy. How you guys doing? <laughs> What's up, my brother? What's up? How you feeling today, man? Uh, I feel pretty good as far as like just feeling pretty balanced. Okay. Um, I would say uh, today just feels like a sit still day. For lazy Sunday vibes. Not even lazy, man. Mm. Just trying to just put them all, all into sit still. If that makes sense. Hey, break, break that down. Like, hmm, I'm trying to process that. It's like, I guess when you appreciate stillness in a certain way mm. you kind of do everything to optimize the experience of stillness mm. so um, yeah that's, that's kind of what i feel like doing like, i just feel like focusing on something mm. but nothing in particular just i just want to direct my attention to something i feel that so like a focused a calm resolve yeah yeah no i, I messed with that i was actually um up working and i, I, I listen to podcasts while i work and I was looking at this, you know, Jay Shetty, have you heard of him? Mm -mm. He's this amazing, almost health and spiritual YouTuber. For sure. And he was interviewing Kobe before Kobe passed away. For sure. And Kobe was actually just talking about that, how he talks so much about stillness. Mm -hmm. So I was asking you kind of what, what was your perspective on it? And I liked how that kind of interplay between his, what he was basically saying stillness was to him was just that not being lost in thought. For sure. You know, not being an observer of your thoughts and not or an, a reactor mm. to your thoughts so i like how you kind of you know boiled that down to what it means to you and i feel like like you said you're, you're somebody who you want to let people know that you know their experience is not alone or like what they're going through yeah you know, they're not the uh, only ones going through it go go more into that how did you kind of make that your one of your your life you know purposes um growing up as a kid i didn't really have a understanding of like people dig people think differently i really didn't know that i thought people just didn't notice things but i didn't know like their whole brain was just different like socially they was just different and i really appreciated social situations a lot and growing up it's not like kids weren't it's not like kids were bullied all the time or something like that and i just saw it but i do see kids that just weren't included like you know what i mean like it was like a soft a soft shunning because the kids just not like them so i figured that's not experience of a childhood that anybody would want. Like, nobody wants to have a teacher say, pick a partner, and everybody duck and dodge that one person. Or nobody really wants to get last picked in any situation. Um, I feel like the biggest problem is with that is that people don't try to break the ice. Like, people kind of just, they kind of just separate themselves. And we're kids doing this, you know, growing up through school. So it's like you would see kids just separate themselves and certain kids gra gravitate towards certain, you know, personalities, but they would never come back together. Like once they would tuck off and click up, they wouldn't, it would be no middle ground again. So I figured 
damn, what's a good way to get a good middle ground? Humor. I noticed that you can have you can have groups in the classroom that are technically divided. It wouldn't even be off of ego for real. You know, they just divide it. But when you notice that when they all laugh at the same time, that I mean they all thought about the same thing at the same time. Mm-hmm. Or they all simultaneously had a funny experience all together. Mm-hmm. So when I realized that, that's kind of how I bridge people together. Like, how I get the shy person to get in with these guys. It wasn't really about them being cool with me. It was about, like, you have you have an opportunity to relate. If you know y'all both laugh at this, this is something I could both talk about outside mm-hmm. of me cracking jokes. You know what I'm saying? And then um, I noticed that people really didn't know that other people felt that way. And when you're a kid, you kind of always feel like nobody understands. Or you feel like your way is superior in a way. Like, you kind of just entitled to the way you think. So um, I kind of noticed that, and I became adamant on getting people to think expansively. Um, I kind of noticed that it was weird to me. Like, if I were to have the same headspace all day, every day, and not really think outside of that, I would drive myself crazy because I feel like, you know, the definition of insanity is the same thing every time. So I kind of had a concept of that as a kid. So I was easily, I was just as bored as I was curious. Mm. But my curiosity, I wanted to share with people. Like it wasn't just like, I felt like I needed them to have a specific reaction that I wanted because I was bored. It was just like, you don't know what you can experience if you would just think outside of this. Now, I didn't really use any like spiritual tools back then. I just had me and my sense of humor. And I kind of devoted myself to being the class clown for that reason, mm. in a way. And then, um, how did the teachers did did they like? How did they approach that? Was it the typical oh the class clown? You feel me? Here you go again. Or, or were they like, I don't know, pulling you aside and almost like you know seeing how you you know get along or seeing how you as a as a child you know mm. perform in the classroom? Were they kind of you know going along with that and like okay I'm a kind of cater to him his personality or were they kind of like where you kind of look down upon upon because i know a lot of cl- i was kind of a class clown too but they get shunned mm-hmm. by teachers like yeah you know what i'm saying instead of understood like he's bored mm-hmm. you know maybe change your approach you know so with that um my class clownness really didn't start until after i was done with all my assignments so when the teacher would give us homework or classwork and i would finish it then i would become bored but with that they never really liked it Like, no teacher ever really liked it. But what kind of kept me safe was that I had a bad classroom. Like, you know, a stereotypical bad bad. classroom. (laughs) So it was a chunk of class clowns in there. But those class clowns, their humor was piercing. Like, it was straight disrespect to the teacher Mm -hmm. or straight disrespect to another student. I would kind of have, like... I would have humor that everybody could laugh at. It wouldn't necessarily make me funnier in every situation, but it would be something... It would be something unique and nobody feels attacked. Like, mm. even if I was the butt of the joke, like, you know, like nobody feels personally attacked. Now, mind you, I did have my moments where I would just have like outbursts. But um, to answer your question, yeah, teachers never really like that. Um, you would think they would understand that. And one thing I personally have a bone to pick is teachers do play favorites. Mm. So even if I was a disruptive child i was never a disrespectful child Mm. so it's like teachers i've noticed in my classroom days that there are kids that will be worse than you and get away with more than you so it's like do you think well i began to think like maybe the teacher just knows his background is different from mine so she expects different from me Mm. like that's kind of why i boiled it down to i'm like you know somebody acting out because their household is different and somebody acting out just because they feel like they have the entitlement to do that in your classroom, mm. then I guess it's two different things. So that is one thing that kind of just made me, well, <laughs> like I was thinking about it. But yeah, I got a, I, got a, I got in trouble a lot, bro. Mm. Both, you said both in home too, you said? Yeah, or? definitely, man. I have, I, I had some super strict parents. Like my dad was, he was so anally strict, but it's like he put passion into his strictness. And then my mother was, um, she was uh she was strict in a different way. It was more like she wanted me to adhere to the rules that didn't exist, like the unspoken rules, but they weren't the most productive of rules, you know? And she kind of had her own internal projections that she kind of put onto me. So it was like, 
if anything, in my personality, she felt was, if she felt like anything that I expressed could be problematic, she would relate it to her problematic experiences and not think about what experiences that could bring me. So it led me to being kind of bottled up mm-hmm. as a kid. And I took opportunities in school to be a class clown because it was also a form of self-expression. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't just boredom. And it was trying to connect kids together. But it was also me. Mm-hmm. You know, it was also me. And I didn't really get to be me at home. So, um, yeah. Do you think that... So I'm the last kid. I'm mm-hmm. the last child. So I ain't gonna lie, I got a lot of attention. You mm-hmm. feel me? Which has its pros and cons. Everything has its pros and cons. Do you think being the middle child kind of played a role in like you kind of having that that unique perspective of like that insight? That I feel like most kids we don't have that insight at that early of an age of like, mm-hmm. oh, some kids get shunned and like some kids you know feel like they don't have an outlet to express them. So do you feel like being the middle child kind of gave you more uh, agency to talk about that? I think so, uh, and I think especially because um, I feel like with me being a middle child, well, actually, I don't know if other middle childs relate to this, but I'll go into this little story. Um, whenever I would get in trouble at home, it would be, I would be kind of made an example of, and I got in trouble the most out of both my sisters. So let's just say my dad shunned me, and if if my dad put a shunning on me, my mom kind of just went along with it because she didn't want to make him mad. And then my two sisters were my two sisters. So what were they going to do? And then they kind of just, they kind of really didn't know how to have heart to hearts for real. Like, it's not like they didn't care about me and nothing like that. We would have fun and so many conversations. But in vulnerable moments, we kind of just let everybody have their space. And when I would notice how it feels to be shunned at home, then you kind of see those signs in other kids in social situations like it's like you kind of see people around eggshells or this is one thing that kind of hurts my heart every time i see it you ever you ever seen a shy kid try to crack that one joke and the joke just don't go well at all like they don't say nothing but they try to say that one thing and it was just the worst joke of all time and it's like you know where it came from like they not they trying and it just it just backfire. Like it'd that be moments like that. Do, that kid will never try again. It's stuff it like that life. where I just be like, it's it's okay. Like if you were to say a, a stupid sentence like that, let's just say stupid for the sake of kids being harsh, then I would probably try to take some, something you said and expand on it and make people make fun of me. Like it's like you ain't gonna be the only corny person in here. And it's like through people making fun of me. I have thick skin. So I can laugh at what they saying about me too. And you kind of feel less, you know, like the heat ain't on you entirely. And that's kind of how I would do it. I would do that a lot. And it kind of, um, it was, it was kind of fun in a way doing stuff like that. Like, um, but you see like people like that build backbones. Like it's, it's times where I've seen it work and it's times where I've seen it not work. Like it's mm-hmm. times where I've, um, stepped in and, been humorous when I see somebody was kind of sucking, <laughs> with cracking mm-hmm. jokes. And then it's times where it's like I would try to add a joke on top of their joke and they would get mad, feeling like I'm trying to steal the thunder that they never had. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so That's um, bars. Yeah. That, you almost like riding through some freestyle <laughs> and they said the thunder that they never had. I mess with that. So, like, fast forward a little bit into high school. Mm-hmm. Um, you said you played a little basketball in middle school. Mm-hmm. And then in high school you got into track. Mm-hmm. Okay. What is something from like track? Cause like how, I'm trying to see how I'm trying to just connect the dots. So like, so you you did track and you said you felt super passionate about that. Mm-hmm. I'm almost wondering, did that track passion kind of replace you know the? Cause, Cause, you said you didn't know for sure you wanted to be a comedian, mm-hmm. but you just knew that you were getting recognized for being funny and stuff like that. Do you think that you know going into track, or how do you how do you explain that journey of how comparing your passion for comedy now mm-hmm. to your your passion to track and field, track and field, right? Mm-hmm. Which would you say you know spoke to you more, or you resonated more with? Um, I'm gonna probably give you two answers to that. With Track and field, specifically, it was for me. You know, like, I'm pushing my limits. I'm running farther than I expected to. I'm seeing results, and I feel radiant when I run. So that was more for me. Comedy is more for everyone else. 
So, you know, track is more of a desire. Comedy is more of a vision. Um, and I feel like visions are for other people. Like you just don't have a vision for yourself. It kind of affects other people. I feel like comedy is one of them things where it's like, it's a form of healing. Um, personally, um, it didn't really replace it because I was still as funny as I was when I was running track. It's just that for me, my personal drive towards pushing my own limits shifted. Like, I never really tried to push limits comedically, you know? It was weird because it was always like, this don't work, that don't work, this don't work, that don't work. But I love it so much, I just let it naturally comes. Like, truth be told, I'm better at freestyling and everything anyway. So I would still write down a joke and then freestyle. And I'm like, damn, I didn't, even write, I didn't even say the joke I just wrote because I love it that much. But with track and field, it was more like, man, like, first of all, use it or lose it. Like, I don't know how far I can go. Like, I'm not going to be young forever. You know, like, you could, I could push my body in ways and just break so many personal records. It was one of those type things. And um, with comedy, it was like, I could, first of all, I can heal people. And then when I started having desires of having a bigger name, it was more like, I could shift the game. That's what it's, it's for. Like, comedy is, for me, is like, man, I could change the game. Um, I don't know if you know, a lot of people complain about modern comedy. They mm, say it's... I haven't noticed. Man, so as a comedian, seeing other older comedians, more seasoned comedians of all races and backgrounds, they say people are being spoon fed. Like, these jokes aren't creative. They're kind of just topics that you kind of want to hear and you keep recycling them, specifically um, with specific black jokes. Like, and I'm only bringing this up because you're a black guy too. Mm. So, with black jokes, we kind of feel like we heard them all already. But yet and still, you still see comedians with the same structure of black jokes. Now, it's not that you can't tell a black joke. The structure don't change. So kind of like how music kind of sound redundant to a certain group of people, comedy is kind of spoon-feeding the same topics over and over again. Mm. And it hasn't really been creative in a way where it, it doesn't really expand your mind. Nowadays, it's just more proper to be controversial. Like, that's what people are doing now. Like, it's not even about being funny no more. It's about being confident when you say something controversial mm -hmm. and seeing if you can keep the crowd. You that's know what almost, I mean? That's almost contrary to, like, what your humor was growing up. You almost was like, oh, let me make a joke that everyone can laugh at but mm -hmm. not be the butt of the joke. Like, let's say, specifically the R joke. Like, I mean, the R word. Mm -hmm. Like, if the Bernie Mac... The R word? Yeah. Racist? Re. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Right. yeah I haven't used that a long time. Good, which so, is a good thing. Okay, okay. So the R word. If Bernie Mac or Steve Harvey 30 years ago would have said the R word, that wouldn't be the butt of the joke. Right. The butt of the joke would be something else. But now people are just like, and they kind of say the R word and that that's it. It's just like they want people to be, oh, he actually said it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like now people have like, they've gotten so soft that like the fundamentals of how comedy started. Mm are just kind of being distorted and now it's just about like well i was thinking it but he said it mm. instead of i never thought about that and it's funny mm. which is so what do you think about people who criticize or like cancel you know these these modern comedians for various reasons like what do you think about the people who come at them i feel like it's the same it's a similar argument when people say people shouldn't do the NFL because of brain damage, it's like you kind of are signing up for this stuff. Now, you're not signing up to be disrespected. But then again, they're not disrespecting you specifically. Like, comedians make up characters and scenarios in real life. So it's like if you were to cancel somebody for them showing a real life situation, why would you do that? Like, if they're preaching something bad or if, if it's hate speech, that's different. But if it's like this actually happened you know like um like if you say if you say something like let's say um i had a comedian I, like i had a comedian i liked and he had problems with the gay community and it's because they feel like he's disrespecting them but his argument was if you want true equality you need to be made fun of like everybody else and i kind of look at that like to an extent that's true like to pull punches with one group and not pull punches with another group is not equality. And it's not like you can't, it's not like you should talk about every topic and force it to be funny. But it's like you do see senses of humor within y'all communities. But 
it becomes a problem when somebody else is expresses that when they're not a part of your community. Like, black people who call each other the N-word. Mm. White people call each other all kinds of names. You know, Mexicans have their own names. And it's not like gay people don't make gay jokes within each other. Yeah, so it's like the humor is the always word. there, right? Yeah. The humor is always there. It's just that you have different associations when somebody else says it. And that becomes the problem. Um, so just like how I said with the NFL thing, it's like if you go to a comedy club, he's a professional comedian. So, yeah, you may get made fun of. But he's not making fun of you for his own personal enjoyment. He's getting paid to make other people laugh. So if even if you were to butter the joke, it's like it could have been anybody, truth be told. Now, if you do have a specific comedian that does that, that's a different story. But it's like it's, that's why it's kind of a lighten up situation. Because if somebody else would get made fun of, you would laugh. Mm. And it's like to be politically correct isn't wrong, but then you clash in philosophies. Mm. Um, so it's almost like a... It's almost like a logical, it's almost like a logical, what's the word? It doesn't make, it's like one plus one is three. Right. Like it doesn't add up because mm. it, it's, it's on one end, you want to be treated equal. You want to be, you know, equality, right? That's what it's mm -hmm. all about. But then the other, other people, other races are that, that are just different from whatever you identify as, who you consider equal. Mm -hmm. they, they they are undergoing that same scrutiny or that same, I guess, being the butt of the joke. Mm -hmm. But you claim you want to be equal, but then you don't want to be the butt of a joke sometimes as well. So you're saying like that, that's yeah. where it's like doesn't make sense. Right. Um, and why? You know, like it, it's really a why. Like why is this not disrespectful for this person, but this is disrespectful towards you? You know, because that's, that's really what it comes down to. You just got to pay attention to why. That's how I feel. Like I'm not saying cancel culture is bad i just don't feel like they canceling all the right people mm. um people love bernie mac but then they cancel somebody else just disrespectful as him mm. and that's why i kind of i keep using him as an example because if he was still alive he would be canceled you know oh, absolutely right and that would be a controversial thing like if they were to cancel bernie mac everybody would kind of be talking about this conversation differently he's not here dave Chappelle is one of those comedians who is kind of controversial already but it's not different when he does it. But it's like, it just comes down to distancing yourself from a certain perspective and just making space for another one. Because you can probably laugh at a joke that you probably never would have thought you would laugh at. That's the thing. I was um, watching this interview with Dave Chappelle, and he was like, the greatest comedians almost bomb the hardest or, or take mm -hmm. the biggest risks. Because it's like, a joke is the funniest when it's like you think they're not going to laugh and they laugh. Mm -hmm. So it's almost as if it's not funny until they laugh. Mm -hmm. So it's like you can, it doesn't matter what you say. It could be the most like controversial shit. But it's like basically it's like the most controversial it is. And it's like you're nervous about it. Like basically you took that risk. You took that mm -hmm. leap of faith. And it's like and that, that's what decides like you bomb or not. Cause like that's that's really what bombing is. It's like you took that risk. Well, sometimes you bomb because it's just like not funny. Yeah. But sometimes you bomb because like people are offended, mm -hmm. right? No, like no one wants to. But it's like if they laugh at that offensive joke, and it, now it's like okay, it's like that's a, that's a great joke. And mm -hmm. it, it's almost like, where do you like take off the veil? Where do you remove the veil? What, what's that? What's that gray area where it's like, okay, I'm an up and coming comedian. You know, I don't want to get canceled, but mm -hmm. at the same time, I'm trying to be great. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, as a comedian, how do you balance, you know, taking risks? Because you mentioned that, like, you haven't really bombed before. Mm -hmm. It's like, everybody laughs. That's great, right? But, like, I, I don't even know if you agree with that statement that I do. every great comedian should bomb yeah, they at do. some point. And I feel like I haven't bombed because, not because I haven't took, taken certain risks. It's because I kind of size up the crowd heavily. Like, even if... Um, even if I didn't have the most laughs I ever had, it's not like people are booing me and like telling me to get off the stage. It's just the times where I feel like I didn't have a good, um, I wasn't received well by an audience was purely because they didn't understand what I was saying. Like, and that's really what it comes down to. Um, and like I said about crowds, you kind of got to mix and match. If I'm telling jokes in front of white people, it's not the same as telling jokes in front of 
middle-aged white people and then white people my age. So even with black people, it's like, I'm not telling jokes to black people my age all the time. I got to tell black jokes to older people. So when you kind of take into account their generation, you can kind of craft jokes that will kind of make sense. Um, you kind of don't expect them to understand a lot of a lot of lingo as it is. And then, um, unless that's what you're trying to make funny. Unless you like criticizing today's generation or something like that. Um it really just comes down to, like, with risks, it's like, it still has to be funnier to you. You know what I mean? Like, and I've, that's advice I've been given from comedians. It's like, if it's not funny to you, don't say it. You, you can't just say something that's funny to them and you not think it's funny in some way or shape or form, you know? And I feel like that's true. It's a form of being genuine. Like, I feel like this is funny. I'm sharing it. Not just I'm cooking up some shit for you to laugh at I could just get paid and walk off you take the passion out of everything I love that I love that yeah it's it's, it's people aren't stupid mm -hmm. people can tell from when something's forced or something is inauthentic yeah and I feel like telling a joke that's that doesn't resonate with you it might be funny like separate from like emotion and everything human but mm -hmm. it, the delivery yeah. How much does delivery play a role in comedy? Man, delivery is like getting a lining after a haircut. Like, you wouldn't just walk out the barbershop with no lining, bro. Like, you need that shit. Like, you need delivery so bad, you can make something not funny so fucking funny with just delivery. And it's people, it's people who aren't really funny by the structure of their jokes. They just funny in their delivery. And it's like, those people understand that. Like, it's just... It's how it's received, and it's like a lot of people actually are funny. Like their concepts do be funny, but their delivery be bad, or be just be like, like let's use DC on Fly for an example. Mm. Um, his his whole personality is just funny, right? But he delivers it right every time. You know, even if he's not saying nothing out of the ordinary, it's like his delivery will get you, and that's that's what's important for sure. Um, but I think that just comes down to first of all knowing who you are, and spacing things out like i had a problem i'm a fast talker so fast talking it's tough so when i was telling jokes it's like i didn't really give them a chance to laugh before i started my next joke so i started my next joke and they're still laughing at the other joke and they didn't hear the next joke so when i said something funny they was like huh you know what i mean because it's like i didn't time it delivery is timing important. yep uh, I have like two more big questions about comedy because it's just it's such it's so interesting to me. It's so interesting to me. One of the things is like we look at somebody like Michael Blackson, mm -hmm. right? Hilarious, but a part of his his hilariousness is just he he kind of embraces a character. Mm -hmm. He's like the dude's been in the U.S. for like twenty years. I'm pretty sure I think he does have African accent, but I'm pretty sure he exaggerates it and like yeah. like nigga is basically African American. Like, but he embraces that i'm gonna speak like this and uh, go sacrifice the small goat you know mm -hmm. shit like that and then like he he embodies that kind of persona and that's what makes that that's what you know amplifies his comedy mm -hmm. right it's, i think they call it like a stick or something i don't know if i'm saying it right but it's like is is that is that important in the comedy like kind of have a character like some people wear oversized shirts some people have a certain look like wear baggy clothes or a fedora like do you have a look or is that like something that that's important i don't even know i personally don't have a look um Partially because that's kind of the aesthetic. Like, if I'm going for cozy, I kind of always kind of just dress in regular stuff. I don't really dress up. But I always, I'm always i always stoned on stage. So it's like I do be making my weed jokes and stuff like that. And I, that's kind of the aesthetic I go for. I would say it is important because that's – you can expand off that. And it keeps you more organized in a way. You know what I mean? Um, but the thing about Michael Blackson is that – he pioneered a character. So let's just say 10 other African men wanted to do that character. Now it's not funny. You know what I mean? So it's like he, like Terry Crews, his thing is the titties. You know, niggas always moving his titties and shit. If another small black man started doing that, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be funny. So that's why it's important to have a character because it will be like, it, it could be a staple. Like you could be somebody who's always changing, but then if you had that staple and it works for you, like, and it's actually you. You connect with it for sure. That's you. Cat Williams had this pimping shit. You know, like it was always pimping, pimping, and woo woo. But it was like, it was funnier because he told you he's never pimped before. 
But it's like you still watching him talk with his cadence and stuff like that. So yeah, staple that. Like the man was in Boondocks, a pimp named Slickback. Like it still stayed with him years later, and that's um, that's important. Like I think a good example I would use for that is we all know Snoop Dogg, right? Now how many of us called him Snoop, Snoop Lion? But we don't though. Like you feel me? Like it's like we know, we know, but. Do we really call him? Like, the first thing that comes to mind is for shizzle. That's Snoop Dogg. Like, that's Snoop Dogg we know. But Snoop Lion is like, oh, yeah. Yeah. You know? So that's why it's like, when you have that staple, and it's, it's so powerful, it might be hard to start a new one over. Mm. So. That raises some great questions. I'm, I'm I, like, I have a big question. Before we go and break, another question I want to ask, though, is um, what is off limits in comedy? I was I was uh, watching this interview with Michael Blackson in the Breakfast Club, and then like it's just an old ass interview. But basically, Kevin Hart was um, being infidelity mm-hmm. with his wife back a long time ago, like 2016 and some shit. And Michael J- Michael Blackson was basically like roast to him, mm-hmm. you know, on one of his shows. And then Kevin Hart got pissed, you know, and was like blasting him on Twitter and shit. So it's like, are there things off limit in comedy? And I know that's not even your approach to kind of like attack mm-hmm. people, but like just from a I feel like you're more informed on that. Is is anything off limits in comedy? Truth be told, in technicality, no. But you also know what you shouldn't say when it's when it's a certain time. Um, like with Michael Blackson and Kevin Hart, specifically I think if you knew who Kevin Hart was and you know he's sensitive about his marriage, you shouldn't have said that. Like, even if it was funny, at the expense of somebody you know, you shouldn't have said that. Now, if it was just funny and he didn't really know how Kevin felt about that, I technically feel like that's fair game. And I use Kevin Hart as an example because Michael Blackson has also been a wide and out. He's made Nick Cannon jokes. And Nick Cannon, clearly everybody knew who his wife was at the time. And we know he got hella kids. We know people think his album sucks. You're dissing somebody completely on his show. He's not sensitive about it. So for Michael Blackson to be able to like, it's like maybe he truly didn't know Kevin was going to be that sensitive. But I don't think in concept what he said was off limits because of the fact that people could talk about their own wives. People could talk about their own families. So it's like you kind of really... It's kind of blurred a little bit. Like, you can't just... People criticize presidents and stuff like that. You know what I mean? It's not like the president canceled him after he was making the jokes. You know? So it's like... I technically don't think so, but I do think it's... That you, like, you do still kind of got to pick your battles as some invisible rule. Mm. Like, um, I wouldn't... I wouldn't go to... I wouldn't go to Texas and just... Oh, yeah, man. 9-11 was an inside job, mm-hmm. and I'm glad y'all lost the war. Like, you know what I mean? Like, of all places. You know, like, you just wouldn't do that. Even if it is funny, it's funny. It's it's a half-truth, because it's going to be funny to some. Um, but, I don't know. Like mm-hmm. I said, if if you knew that was going to get under Kevin Hart's skin, you shouldn't have said it. Yeah. So it's just like reading the crowd, Kinda you know what I'm yeah. saying, trusting your intuition, and just like, just like thinking about shit before you just, you know, spreading mm-hmm. it up. I feel so rude. Like, you feel me? I got a guest and we didn't pour up. You feel me? Like, how dare? Have you tried lemon ginger nah, kombucha yeah, before? Yeah, definitely tried it. Knock yourself out. I got you. I got you. Yeah, we finna kill the bottle. Ah! Okay, we got it. We got it. Am I holding both? Like, okay. I don't. Nah, you I'm holding both. I was, I'm this holding both. Yeah, okay, uh, now we. I was gonna say that. Man! <laughs> we out here tripping. Fresh cup. All right. There we go. But yeah, man. Yeah, we finna so. kill that bottle. But yeah, Kavita, sponsor me. I'm asking nicely. <laughs> For sure. I'm asking nicely now. Um, but yeah, man, knock yourself out. We got. I know you've been staring. I've been seeing your eyeball, eyeballs drop down. Bro, the mushrooms, the, the mango, the. I'm just like. We got the asparagus, you feel me? For sure. We eating great. We got radish, mushrooms. Not the psychedelic kind. Man, you know, like, there was one day. I was eating nothing, nothing but spinach for like three weeks. Just straight spinach, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, spinach and everything. And I was just in the shower, right? And I'm just like, man, like, I feel crazy strong right now. Like, like it just feels so weird. And then that day, it was like um, I had fell down the stairs. And then I did like, it was like a reflex. 
and I ended up doing a handstand. And I'm like, veggie powder. On oh, accident? Yes, like I did a handstand. Like I was like, I was doing a handstand. It was like two seconds. It wasn't perfect. But I fell down the stairs and somehow I ended up in the handstand and I was just doing it for two seconds. And I didn't notice until I fell down again. Like when I like fell and hit my butt, I was like, how did I? I was like, what? <laughs> how old were you? Man, I was like 19. Like, but I was like, bro, vegetables are crazy. Like, but going into that, um, I wanted to talk about this one thing, and I want to see if you experience it for sure. I want to see if you experience it. Mm. Um, Do you feel like you're able to think within your body, but not your mind? Like, absolutely. And how does that go for you? So I meditate. Mm -hmm. I meditated today. I meditated yesterday. After about twenty minutes in, twenty five minutes, and this didn't happen overnight Mm -hmm. i was meditating and nothing would happen for like a year but i just stayed consistent Mm -hmm. i just had hope that i know if i keep doing this something will happen and it like two two months ago it just started clicking now Mm -hmm. like i just get into this state where i'm like i i don't want to i don't want to confuse people um you know how like you can like sense like you're in your head you can feel your thoughts and Mm -hmm. it's like okay like you're in your head you're here have you ever been in a point where it's like you're just in the moment Mm-hmm. You just like you feel like everything is like kind of rushing in at once. It's almost like psychedelic. Mm-hmm. And I, I have like the lights on in the room. I turn them low. So there's as, as little stimulus as possible. So I can just completely just, you know, enter my inner world. And at that moment, I feel very, I don't know if, if this is relatable, but that almost that body, it's like it's as, it's as if my body and my mind had merged mm-hmm. into just oneness. And it, I, I no longer identify with like me. It's like in that brief moment, I identify as like nothing almost. It's like I become, but not nothing as in like worthless, Mm -hmm. but like nothing as in like no thing. I am not thing. I am not matter. I am not this. I'm just, I'm just consciousness. For sure. Type shit. That's, that's the only way I can describe. I feel like words are so limiting. Especially for that experience. First of all. Yeah. You know, but that's, I don't know if that helped, but that's kind of been like maybe what i experience of body communication or yeah um i had a lot of different experiences with meditation like staying consistent um how long have you been meditating for oh man i started covid Mm. when it yeah covid 2020 like april so it's been about like 18 months year and a half type shit yeah the way you are i thought you was meditating longer bro for real, for real. oh no 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 you're no. doing nice like you definitely staying consistent thanks i appreciate it man so check this out i've been meditating since i was like 16 and in my younger days i wasn't hot-headed but mm. i was reactive but i'm only reactive to confusion like whenever i get confused it's like my personality shows his other traits you know and it's like i would do anything to have certainty and i would kind of do that for anything and like um i told you before i uh i stopped being a christian when i was still 13 14 years old and so i was seeking truths like crazy but i didn't meditate until i was 16 and when i did that what what it felt like to the mic oh yeah for sure what it felt like was that during the day when i wasn't meditating whenever somebody would say something and I really like related to what they were saying and I felt it to be true. It felt like my brain had like a gust of wind over it. Like it was just weird. Like I literally felt my brain cooling off from like adamantly trying to find answers all the time. And then with that, I was just like, wow, I really am overworking myself. Like, and it would just come like wind, bro. Like every time, like it would just be weird. Like some spidey sense or something where it would just be like, whoa, I'm thinking too much. Let me relax. And then it wasn't until. I started feeling my, like you called it, oneness. I felt empty but spatial at the same time. And it felt like mm. it felt like when I emptied out my brain, stuff was happening while I was doing nothing. And I, I felt this weird connection to nothingness because I felt like when I'm doing nothing, something is happening. And it just seems like um, I would spend most of my days trying to connect with nothing. Because when I would come out of meditations, it seems like my day would be more vibrant. And not just because how I feel on the inside, but it just seems like stuff just gravitates or attracts to me. 
in a way where it's like, huh, life is getting interesting. And then um, I realized I wanted to go deeper and understand the meditation because I wanted to share with other people. Like my wife here, um, she didn't meditate before we talked or anything. And I really didn't understand how people felt when they meditated. Because I do know that people feel different. I just don't know what they take from it. So I was curious to finally meditate with other people to see what their experience would be. Because mind you, when I first started meditating, it was by myself. I wasn't really talking to nobody about how I was meditating because I know they didn't do it. So now, with me having some years under my belt meditating, I just want to see what they would say and if I could relate and if they could have better words of explanation than me. And the first day we meditated together, she cried. And I've never seen that experience before. And then I was just like, wow like something it's, it's some everybody has some connection to stillness in a different way and that's what made me really want to get expansive and stay even more consistent with meditating that is beautiful mm-hmm. that is really beautiful what so like so you said you were vegetarian yep for a while what kind of kick started that oh man so I was watching a documentary. I was watching documentaries on food as a youngin, and that wasn't really enough to make me a vegetarian, but it was enough to make me eat healthier, even when I was eating meat. Then I was watching a UFC interview. It was <laughs> Nate Diaz. And Crazy motherfucker. Man. And he said, I don't remember who he was fighting at this very moment, but it was like, he, it was like three fights he, he won one fight with the dude lost one fight with the dude won one fight with the dude and he said the third time he fought him it was he won because he changed his diet and he was like when I was eating meat like my gas tank was always on E man like I was getting so much more tighter and then he said when I became a vegetarian I had energy I've had clarity like my body just felt lighter and I'm like wow that would go great for running then um, I guess because that's how YouTube algorithms work there was another video with NFL athletes and they were testing their blood and they were like they were doing a before and after between them eating meat and them not eating meat in a two week span and their blood looked totally different like it was different compositions of their blood and I noticed that and that really kind of it made me really want to hop out the seat and throw out the meat in the garbage mm. and then right after that in the same time period my father was pre-diabetic so I was just like I don't know if that's the universe speaking to me or what, but I can't lose if I'm being healthy anyway. Mm. All I can do is be healthier, as healthy as I could possibly be, so it's not a problem. And, um, yeah. Wow. Would you say, because a lot of things happen. So, in high school, you know, you said you did track and field, and then, you know, you had that accident, mm. and you broke you broke both both feet. Mm. And then, is this before your, your meditation and all that practice? Um, no, I was definitely meditating before I broke my feet. Okay. So um, to follow that up, you said your parents, you know, you went through kind of a situation where you're just dealing with, you know, the separation of your parents. Mm-hmm. So, like, th- those two situations, you know, how did they compare? How, how did breaking your, you know, your feet and the separated, which one affected you more? And I don't even know if that's that you can compare the two, but how did all of that and then the, the practice, your spiritual practice intertwine with all of that? How did that play? So let me tell you something about me. Um, This is a personal perception I've had growing up. I felt like my parents, well, they never got along for real. Like, even though they was married, they never acted like they were married. They were always roommates with kids, truth be told. And um, they wouldn't really find too many excuses to talk to each other and nitpick each other unless they were just being petty, toxic, and tit for tat. Um, A lot of their arguments... I felt like started because of me. Me getting in trouble in school, they wanted to discipline me in two different ways. And they would have arguments from that. So even as far as me like feeling closer with one parent than another parent, because my dad was harder on me at some point in my childhood. So I was leaning on my mom more. But then my mom was like, through me leaning on my mom more, I was more exposed to her projections and stuff like that. So me taking on the way she thinks, it also made me have a weirder relationship with my dad at some point until it kind of really balanced out. And um, because of that, um, I felt like my parents, I was like an instigation for them to argue a lot. And when I broke my feet, 
they came together in a way I never seen before. Like they kind of were just nobody in my family has any major injuries and nothing like that. Like we pretty much be a healthy bunch. But when that happened, it was like they kind of just chilled out, mellowed out. They was on the same team. So through that experience, I realized that this is temporary. Like y'all can't turn it off. Like even if it's a specific reason, y'all not gonna argue all day twenty four seven. It was weird was while I was still recovering, my dad and my mom started going on lunch dates and stuff like that. And I feel like because um, at the time I was becoming more, I was coming more into my spiritual identity. So I'm taking what I, I'm taking my experiences and I'm expressing what I experienced to my mom. And I feel like that's helped her. Like, instead of taking on her projections, I'm kind of giving her something back that kind of, like, neutralizes a certain way of thinking. And then I feel like she kind of took those principles and wanted to fix things with my dad in a certain type of way. Like, I kind of made her think deeper into their relationship. Not directly, though. So, um, it wasn't really a hard period of time. It was, like, it was a weird form of enlightenment. But I felt like my reality itself was shifting. Like, Whereas I said I did track for me, it seems like the event of me not running no more kind of made me think into other people more. So I don't really, I don't really know how to explain it, but it just feels like it just brought me closer to my family. Maybe because I was staying put more. Mm. No, no, I feel like for a lot of people listening right now, you know, I was watching this interview with um with Will Smith and he was talking about. You know, his his parents separated mm-hmm. was a time in his life where he felt suicidal. You know, he's only felt suicidal like twice in his life. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the times. So I, I can, you know, luckily I, I was blessed. My parents are still together. But I can't imagine, you know what I'm saying, how for a lot of people that can just be devastating. You know, especially for younger children. You know, once you kind of grow up, you kind of yeah. understand life more. But as a, so I'm saying, like, I feel like you explaining your perspective of it, you know, in contrast to, you know, how being more reflective you know, with, uh, you know, losing some mobility with your feet, you know, how that kind of all kind of, pre- I don't want to say, could you say that almost prepared you Yeah. to kind of, you know, deal with that, that future separation yeah. later? So the thing about me and other people's stories of divorce is different because of the fact that at some point me and both of my sisters wanted our parents to split because we wanted them to succeed as individuals and we felt like they weren't happy together why did they stay together because us they didn't want to do the child support they didn't want to be weekend parents that's what they didn't want to do and i appreciate them for that i actually do love having both parents around but where like i we wanted them to split and we wanted them to split for so long and they never did so we kind of didn't believe it was going to happen and then when it finally started happening it was like we just changed our expectations damn you know what i mean like it was like whereas we thought it was gonna happen and we was prepared for it we just kind of let our guard down and now y'all talking about y'all want to split and we kind of just got used to y'all having this toxic on and off you know and then i wouldn't say that alone made me feel suicidal but i do say like my parents were they were taking their frustrations out on me more excuse me no problem they were taking their frustrations out on me more and it made me begin to resent them as individuals like i never really disliked them as parents i just didn't understand them you know but i know people are generationally different but it seems like as individuals it's like why are you treating me like this like and you know i don't have anything to do with none of this and you just understand more as you get older i guess like everything's pretty much been patched up now um actually after the little divorce stuff me and my parents have gotten closer in a way that I never mm-hmm. expected. And my parents have gotten more spiritual in a way. Like, it's weird, but it just seems like these moments of struggles bring some kind of abundance if you get through them. Like, if you really stay put and try to get through them the right way, though. Not just going through it just for the sake of going through it. But if you really try to, like, devote yourself to seeing positivity turn this situation around, it will be there. Wow, that's beautiful, man. You know, because, like... Like, I... It's so easy, you know, it's so easy to get caught up while the situation is unfolding Mm -hmm. and think that this is it, you know, well, here, here it is like it's over with, 
You know what I'm saying? Like, to think the worst. But sometimes you got to close a window to open up a door. Mm -hmm. And it, and it goes back to attachment. Definitely. And holding on to the status quo. And sometimes by letting go, right, you, you unblock your blessings. Yeah. And now they can flow because going back to being authentic, you know, now maybe your parents as individuals are allowed to move more into who they really want to be. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Instead of being held by by a status quo or a lot of a lot of people just do things because that's what's normal. Mm -hmm. I don't want my parents to look at me as a fuck up. I don't want, you know, just other people so they they stay in situations to not look like something else, but it's no, what do you what do you want to look like to you? Exactly. That's the real question. So I love how you kind of you know, brought that, oh, there was a silver lining on the other side of that. And it's beautiful that you, that you felt like you could get closer to your parents. That's, mm -hmm. it's almost as if, w when did you, you know, so obviously, you know, you're 21. Right. You know what I'm saying? And you're married. That's mm -hmm. a big thing. That's a big thing. Mm -hmm. how, how would you say, you know, going back to your comedy, would you say being married made you a better comedian? How, how is that, how has that impacted, I guess, your your passion or your career um i think being married does add to comedy in a way because it's like now telling jokes to older people i definitely got some marriage jokes for sure like not even just in concept it's like these are actual married things i didn't understand like when you hear a comedian talk about their wife and stuff like that you kind of just I feel like this might be my personal opinion, but I kind of just associate them with gender roles. You know, like, it's just like, oh, this is what your wife do because that's your wife. And it's like you would hear other comedians complain about the same things with their wives and stuff like that. And you would hear female comedians complain about the same things with their husbands and boyfriends. So I just kind of just generalize them, put them in gender roles. That's, what they, that's just what they got to go through on their side of the marriage. But actually being in a marriage, and I'm actually seeing the vice versa between my femininity and my masculinity and her femininity and her masculinity it's just like oh so now i kind of have jokes that could be funny for both of us mm. and not just men laughing at their wives for nagging and wives laughing at their husbands for being incompetent you know so i do feel like it's helped um i feel like the only weird thing is it's like i'm a pretty like I'm pretty inappropriate when I talk about stuff on like on stage. So it do be kind of weird when I'm saying stuff about other women mm. you know, or stuff like that. And they kind of just look at her like they kind of <laughs> would just. Are you being a, she'd be in the crowd. Yeah, she'd be in the crowd. <laughs> like, And I, I would go so often they would see her always there. You know, we buy drinks and stuff like That's that. That's beautiful. So it was like they know who my wife is or if they don't even know it's my wife. They know who my girl is. Mm. Right. <laughs> and so they would kind of look when I would talk about some some wild shit and they'd be like, um. But then she keep coming back, so they be confused. <laughs> like, mm. but I do think it's helped. I think me being single, um, if I were to be a single comedian, I think my jokes would be more. Um, they would be more based around like my experience, you know. But now being married, I realize my jokes can be like our experience, mm. and it's like people is it, it, it i feel like it just opens more doors you know to just connect with relating to people and making them laugh at the same time mm. what 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 does a, so like how does the or, or this is a two-point question so going back to the comedy i've always wondered like so i listen to the joe rogan podcast mm -hmm. and like a lot of comedians come on and they talk about like how they come up with material and like yep. some of them talk about how like they freestyle and like it takes months to prepare like, how do you prepare your material is it freestyle is it like you know how long does it usually take you to prepare material and also you know what kind of inspires you know your material like what what, what themes you know typically do you pull from okay so when i first started comedy i used to write all day i used to write all day 24 7 kept a little notepad with me um only problem is my hands were cramped like, they would cramp. I would write so much. They would just cramp up. So, at some point, I was just like, I'm going to start freestyling. Um, and then, it was times where freestyling didn't go right. Because in my early days of doing comedy, I was more nervous. And then, uh, it was like, um, I had this problem with, if I wasn't the first person to go on stage, people would tell the jokes I was going to tell. And it would be weird. Because it would be like, 
it's a topic that I thought was just far out, and then I would hear somebody hop on stage and say it. So it would kind of take my momentum away. So then I kind of felt forced to freestyle in a way. I would say, in the past year, well, all 2021, everything I wrote down was 15 minutes before I went on set. Mm. What do I pull from? Um, it pretty much be exaggerations of the day. Like, if I had to tell a joke right now, like, about right now, mm. I'd probably be like, yeah, man, I'm outside. This crazy Jamaican nigga outside with no fucking socks, <laughs> passing out mangoes. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's, shit, it's, yeah. I, can, I could embellish it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, technically it happened. But then it's like, you know who I'm talking about. But for them, it's like, if they were to see you in public, they yeah. could be like, that's the guy. That's they the would know guy. shit. Like, it would yeah. be funny. So it would be like, I would take real, like, real memories and just keep embellishing them. Or sometimes the situations would actually, like, it's some life situations where people are just like, bro, that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So it's funny. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they'd be like, man, this man's capping. But it's like, yeah, I kind of would just pull them from. Things I know people could understand, and then I actually thought it was funny in the moment. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that's I love I love how you you know kind of bringing this all back to just understanding and mm -hmm. like having a common ground, right? And you know sometimes just all of this coming back. If if I go back to like this understanding and ignorance. Mm -hmm. How would you say, what, what would you say, because like sometimes looking at things from a bird eyes, eyes view, it's hard to distinguish if something was done intentionally, mm -hmm. if something was like, and this is going back to like why we get frustrated or what, what makes us tick, why we get pissed off. Mm -hmm. And it's like, was this intentional or was this just ignorance? You know, what what is that line of you understanding you know which would you say do you think that from your experiences you mm -hmm. know the trials and tribulations you know going through you know just even dealing with your parents and their pro the projection of your mother and stuff like that would you say that was that was out of ignorance or would you say that was more so malicious or just like how much speaking to the audience Got you. How important is, is educating yourself? Hmm. I think I'm going to answer that question in three ways. So, I feel like maliciousness is still a form of ignorance. Because it's like, you just understand something better, but you still don't understand why you really shouldn't do that. Like, you know what I mean? Mm. So, I feel like it's just a more egotistical way to be ignorant. Mm. Maliciousness. You know, it's just, it's, I feel like it's like that. Um... Because you have to put a lot into maliciousness, but you're ignorant to the fact that the energy you could have put in being malicious, you could put into being loving and expansive. And clearly you haven't felt that because if you did, you wouldn't go back to doing this. I just can't see those two happening, you know, or maybe that's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. I feel like you can't be such a loving person that you just was like, nah, ignorance. Because you kind of devote yourself to being loving if you really feel it, you know, like if you're really there, you feel it. Um ignorance um i feel like it is i feel like it's unconscious in a way but i feel like those are opportunities i take to try to help people notice why they reacted to something or mm. that they reacted to something i can't necessarily say what is conscious and what's an unconscious action and i feel like i've run into problems trying to help people sort out the two truth be told definitely run into problems so um i try to when people ask me questions, I try to ask them questions so they can kind of let the answers roam in their head mm. or try to figure it out in some way, shape, or form. Um, I feel like even in a comedic standpoint, like if people didn't understand a joke, it's not necessarily because they're ignorant. Maybe I could have just done better to communicate mm. something. You know, like people aren't as ignorant as people think. I feel like truthfully, the mediums of communication are just as broken. Because it's like, I know for sure these people can get it. It just has to be communicated to them. And that's the hard part. Mm. Like, um, you know how, like, uh, let's, let's say, like, a little a baby, mm. like a, a two-year-old or three-year-old, they're hungry, 
but they keep swatting a spoon away. Mm-hmm. So it's just like you have to you have to somehow get them to get what they need by being creative. You know what I mean? So it's like you don't want this baby not to eat, even though the baby swatting a spoon away. You're not finna find. You make me eat then, cause that's not proper parenting. You gonna let the baby starve? But it's like you have to devote yourself because you care, not because not because it's unfair and that's just what you got to do. Because you care, you're going to try to find any creative way mm-hmm. to help people get what they need. And I feel like that's all it comes down to. So it's almost making an excuse to like make sure that you're you're doing your part mm-hmm. to be as clear and transparent as possible because by your example that inspires others. Precisely. And we all understand each other better. Even if people and this is another thing, people aren't really patient for waiting for the seed to turn into a tree they kind of plant the seed and they want it to you know sprout up it's like you exercising grace and patience no it it won't be the most convenient thing for your emotions at the time but people can recognize that even if it's really late in life like people could come back and was like i'm sorry i was acting this way i did see how you tried to handle that i thank you for that too i really needed that i was just lost where i was at but it will come back around. People just have to wait for it. And they shouldn't be egotistical for it to come back around. Like, it shouldn't be like a, well, I knew I was right the whole time. Like, it shouldn't be one of those because that's not what it's about. Um, but, yeah. That's beautiful, man. No, I love that. Just really, really inspiring people to just move more into their divinity, move more into being authentic mm-hmm. and real and just being more of what they want to see and moving away from being a victim and moving more into being a creator mm-hmm. of what you want to see. Because I feel like the energy is all about initiative. It's all about, you know, being a pioneer. And, and it's easy to be a victim and kind of, you know, receive the blame. And and, 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 and it's kind of satisfying even to be like, oh, okay, I'm comfortable because I can always say this is happening because of this. So I don't actually have to change. Mm-hmm. But when you take responsibility, you know, you change and then the people around you change and to also not make the reason you change to come back later and be like, see how smart I am. But no, it's just so that you can be fulfilled in life, mm-hmm. you know, on the day to day basis. So I love, you know, I, that really brought things full circle. What are, what are some things that you're working on now? And I know you, you know, you do stand up. How can people, you know, look forward to, you know, reaching out to you and just connecting. And I know you're on Snapchat too. Yeah. And people definitely need to hear your message. You know what? What's your information and what's what are some things coming up? Um, truth be told, I would say I have a stronger Snapchat presence than anything. Um, that's because I recently changed Instagrams. I had got hacked and stuff like that. And I kind of just took the opportunity to get away from social media after I got hacked so I can work on myself internally more. Um, that's what I work on the most. I try to make sure my messages are clear and concise and they're not coming from a distorted place. Um, I would say people could definitely add me on Snap at Gemini Way, two eyes. Um, I would say um, my Instagram will start having more stuff on it later in the year as far as comedy and as far as um, spiritual advice and just entertaining things. Um, that will definitely be later in the year as far as like May, June. Um, I'm kind of a perfectionist. I like my stuff ready when it's ready, not just when I, you know what I mean? Um I do have comedy videos. I haven't edited yet. So, like I said, it's all going to come in time. Uh, I'll definitely be posting on the Instagram more, and I'll be updating people on Snapchat for sure. I love that. One more time, how can they reach you on uh, social media? Uh, Gemini Way, uh, G-E-M-I-N-I-W-E-I-I. And you just add me on Snap for sure. Fantastic. Yeah. It's been beautiful. It's been a pleasure. Man, with that being said, um, stay hydrated. Definitely. Stay breathing in that good-ass oxygen. And most importantly, stay basic. You still wanna go to the race? Can't take this damn, it's okay. We gonna party the day. Uh, anxiety, where did you go? Depression, you can't say hello. Say then are my friends are my foes. Say then are my friends are my foes. Hey, you still wanna go to the race? Can't take this damn, it's okay. We gonna party the day.